thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, my name is Liz with the Chicago Bruseum. And uh, I'll be asking our lovely panel of guests some questions today about some exciting stuff, past and present. Um, as always, please use that chat room as your virtual tap room, pub, lounge, uh, groggery, whatever your preferred term is. Um, chat with one another as you wish. Share what you're drinking. I, of course, am drinking some Metropolitan beer today. Uh, my absolute favorite summer beer, Jetstream, which is now in a can, which is great because I'm going to take it kayaking with me as I kayak to Metropolitan. Um, it's really a win-win-win for, for me this summer. Um, I uh, will also be taking questions from you in that chat room. So again, uh, share your stuff, um, ask the questions. Um, I will be potentially taking those questions and asking them if they're relevant throughout the whole chat. Otherwise, we'll get to them at the end and we're gonna mute you all immediately. Uh, and then basically after that, um, we would love for you to unmute yourself as well and ask the question yourself at the end if, it, if, it, uh, if we're all good there. So um, that's kind of all the business we have. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, this is, um, I can't even tell you how many of these we've been doing, um, a lot. Uh, at least two weeks since mid-March, um, and much of that is due to you guys all being here consistently, uh, supporting the Bruseum, and very much in part to our friends and uh, board members and supporters and partners um, who are willing to share their knowledge um, of all things beer history and culture. So I am particularly excited about this chat for several reasons. Um, first of all, it's very uh, uh, near and dear to my heart because it does that blend of um, history meeting modern era um, beer and community. And the other thing is, is that I am very much a believer in collaboration no matter what industry you're looking at. And so when there is a beer collaboration, we all get very excited about it. And one of the things that we've been trying to do at the Bruseum is certainly create collaborative projects um, within the Bruseum, which is a collaborative project, to look a little bit uh, at history and culture. And so um, we're gonna get started on the story of Conrad Site Brewing Company. Uh, it, uh, I've met these three panelists in various formats. Um, Tracy actually is the board president of the Bruseum. Um, so that's an extra special bonus for us. Um, so Tracy Hurst from Metropolitan Brewing is here. Lauren Mack, who is the direct descendant of Conrad Sype himself. When I met Lauren and she told me um, who she was, I was immediately excited because it you know, tugged on all those history, history hearts uh, for me. Um, and uh, I met David, uh, who runs um, Black Point Estate uh, and Gardens, um, and knows all things Sipe in history in regard to that company. So it really is an interesting uh, melding of the three. And so with that, I'm going to, let's begin with, with the past and talk a little bit about Conrad Sipe, his journey to the United States, to Chicago, um, how he built his brewery, because it is actually an incredible story and a little bit about Black Point Estate uh, in Lake Geneva. So with that, I'll turn it over to David. David, how are you? I'm great, Liz. Thanks for inviting us and always being so fun to collaborate with. And uh, although I don't think I've met Tracy in person yet, I've tasted your beer and it's fantastic. And Lauren's actually my landlord. So uh, we com completely <laughs> closed that loop. So it's, uh, it's, been, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, I, we're really excited at Black Point, which is the summer um, residence of Conrad and Katerina Sipe, which is now a Wisconsin Historical Society site that's open normally May 1st through October 31st. This year we're shooting for a July 1st opening in a limited capacity. So I'll plug the website, blackpointestate.org. Go to that if you want to Lake Geneva this summer and experience life as a fat cat, 19th century Chicago brewer. Uh, this is the place to, to, to see what that wealth generated. And the Sipe family lovingly took care of this house from 1888 through 2005. 
when Bill Peterson, uh, Lauren's uncle, actually donated the property, great uncle, donated the property um, to the state of Wisconsin. But I think as beer enthusiasts, you're probably most interested in the, the actual beer history. I've got about 40 pages, so if I have about three hours, is everybody <laughs> going to speak with me? I'm kidding. Um, so Conrad was born in 1825 in Germany, and like a lot of Germans during the 1840s, as that confederated group of independent states is starting to gel, and there's a lot of strife, civil war, revolution, he decides in 1849 he's going to try his luck in the U.S. So he, um, he migrates and he ends up in Rochester, New York. There he meets a woman named Maria, they get married, and then around 1850, he moves to, um, to Lyon. During those formative years, he tries his hand at running a hotel, uh, farming, and also he drives a beer wagon for an outfit called Miller Brothers Brewing. It's not the Miller in Milwaukee on Plank Road, it's a much smaller outfit. So we think that's where he gets first exposed to the brewing process because his background in Germany, he's a carpenter and a, he doesn't have um, a, a brewing background as far as we can tell. But uh, shortly after this experience with the Miller Brothers Brewing, he opens up a small brewery and uh, you know, he's doing okay. It's, it's pretty small. It's like six employees, thousand barrels of beer a year. And the, the brewery burns to the ground in 1854. So not to be uh, too dissuaded by that setback, he builds a second brewery, this time not a brick. And we're not exactly sure if he has to sell the hotel, sell the farm, where he gets the capital from, but the family has nowhere to live. So he actually includes housing for his family in that second brewery. So I always like to say this makes him the first home brewer and everybody's supposed to groan because that's like, that's, that literally is the best joke I have today. But that second brewery does really well, um, and they're growing, and they continue to grow. I think Tracy's smiling, so hopefully that was because that joke was so bad. But um, by around 1860, 61, of course, you know, the United States is in the war. Water is not a very um, potable, you know, source of, uh, of refresh refreshment. So the military is starting to buy up and ship beer all over the country. And so things are looking really good for Conrad and his brewery. We think uh, there's a merger that takes place um, right around 1858, so shortly before the Civil War starts. Site merges and joins into another um, business relationship with a gentleman named Frederick Lehman. We don't have a lot of information on Lehman, but our research indicates that we think Lehman had a little bit more capital, but Sipe was probably the better brewer of the two because by all indications, it looks like site recipes are what they continue to use, but Lehman has a little bit more um, financial strength. So things are going really well, 1860s and 18, early 1870s, they're, they're growing, they're on the south side of Chicago. Uh, for you Chicago residents, you might know where Michael Reese Hospital was on the south side. Um, if you don't know where that location is, it's uh, South Cottage Grove, in East 31st Street. So if you want to Google that later, the hospital's gone, uh, but that is the same property that the brewery, the original site brewery was located. That south side location is significant because what happens in Chicago in 1871? Chicago fire. Uh, there's 12 large breweries in Chicago the day before the fire, the day after the fire, there's five. So imagine if a fortuitous circumstance for Sipe. So Sipe and Lehman go from being a pretty large player to about 1872 and 1873, producing more beer in the United States than anybody. Um, and so that's, uh, if they only hold that title for about two years, and then they get lapped in production by all those gentlemen up in Milwaukee. And there's a couple of advantages to Milwaukee versus Chicago. Um, as you know, Chicago is built on a swamp, and so lager beer, which needs cold fermentation, requires ice and eventually machine uh, refrigeration to allow that to happen, and Milwaukee has these wonderful caves. Uh, if you've toured the Miller Brewery uh, currently, you 
but they still have them on the original case. So it just makes the beer in Milwaukee a little bit more affordable to produce. And so it gives Milwaukee an edge. Um, and they really hold on to that first tier of production till the early 1900s. And then it goes back and forth between Milwaukee and St. Louis until the 1950s. But that's a whole other story. So um, things are going really well for Sipe and Lehman. Lehman dies in a horse and buggy accident in uh, around 1872, early 1873. Uh, Conrad, not to, 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 to miss out on an opportunity, he buys out Lehman shares in the brewery and then really consolidates the business. Uh, he is the sole proprietor at that point. Does really well. Um, he's a little bit older. Then uh, the E-Lines who are running the Schlitz Brewery, he's a little bit older than Miller, a little bit older than Blatt's, by about 15, 18 years. So in some ways, um, that makes him uh, uh, a very respected figure in that industry. We have some photographs, I, I, I meant to bring it up, but I, I couldn't find it, of some younger brewers all wearing the um, fashion of the day, which were these um, bowler style hats. And Conrad's in the middle of the photograph and he's wearing a, a beaver hat, like the old Abe Lincoln sort of, you know, stovetop hat. It, it looks like, you know, he's maybe about 20 years out of fashion with the younger guys. And I think in some ways that also plays into the fact that why uh, Sipe Brewery sort of gets pushed down from the top to around six or seven by the end of Conrad's life, because they're not maybe as hungry to try new innovations and new technologies that maybe an upstart outfit that's on the way up um, is trying to carve out their market share. But uh, Sipe holds on to that brewery until 1890 when he passes away. And then the, the family is still involved until 1933, but it is sold to a large British holding company um, Chicago, they are a conglomerate called Chicago Consolidated Beverage and Malting Company or Malting and Beverage Company. I always get that confused. But there's a recession in the United States, pretty significant in the early 1890s, and there is not a recession in Great Britain. So a lot of British investors are buying up all sorts of business in the United States, and beer makes for a really good business, um, even in recession periods. So the, the Sipe family does stay involved as principal management right through the 1930s. There's a couple of references in a Chicago history book that, that indicates that they may have made beer for the, Sipe, or for the um, Capone Syndicate. You're never gonna find any records on that, but uh, there's a great Chicago history book that makes a couple of references to that. The brewery is shuttered in 1930. And then in 33, it is sold to the Michael Reese Hospital System because they're adjacent and it's going to be expanded. Um, what I thought I would do is just a couple of quick photos so you get the scale of this operation. I'm going to do a screen share here. So th this was a booklet produced by the Site Brewing Company for the 1893 exposition. And we'll just quickly look at... Um, Oh, let's see if I could advance this here. Ah, I should be able to. There we go. Um, these are big operations. I mean, they're massive city block enterprises. So the main office where most of the commerce would have taken place is where, you know, you would have bought and sold your, or not sold, but paid for your, your orders. But then uh, if you look at the brew house here, if you've been to the Pabst, facilities, which is now a hotel, you'll see these copper and uh, brew kettles. These are very large enterprises. Um, cooling room to get the beer down to a cool enough temperature to move into settling tanks. Then there's the fermenting room, the ice cellar here, which would have um, required machine refrigeration. How does this beer get to market? Well, now it's all metal kegs that get washed out. They would have had an entire cooperage on site to, to build wooden uh, kegs, also to take care of the wagons that are required to get the beer to market. Uh, these are these ice machines that are being uh, used to pr produce the cooler temperatures. Boiler house, I mean, this is a big operation, so you kind of get the gist of it. Um, bottling house, the site beer was available in bottles by the 1890s. 
malting floors, seven for that. Uh, I love this shot of the mad dash of getting the beer out every day to market. Um, we think the Sipes use Percherons. We know the Anheuser-Busch outfit used as Clydesdales. Uh, the Pabst uh, Enterprise uses Percherons. But this is a big operation. I mean, these are the original Teamsters. And then in types of beer, which we'll turn it over to Lauren in a second to talk about Sipe beer, but there are three main sellers in the 19th century. Salvatore, which is a Bach. A Columbia, which is a pretty light beer. We don't know if this was made specifically for the uh, exposition or if it was just a happy coincidence. And then a pale ale. And uh, they had about 15 other types of beers that they brewed under the Sipe label. They ultimately acquire Westside Brewing. Um, so it's, it's really a big enterprise. Um, they never fall out of the top 10 in terms of production until prohibition. And then of course, at that point, all records are, are not kept. You could still brew certain products um, for medicinal purposes. You could also brew non-alcoholic. Sipe has a non-alcoholic beer, which is called Malt Sinu. Um, it's sold because it's considered liquid bread, it's hearty, it'll fortify you, but it was probably less than 0.05% alcohol. So that kind of gets you from 1888 to 1933. And then um, I guess we'll turn it over to Lauren to talk about, we know nothing happens from 33 until 2019. I have a, David, I have a quick question um, sure. relevant to, to Sipe himself. Um, so Le Frederick Lehman passes away in his accident and, and Conrad Sipe takes over and changes the brewery name to Conrad Sipe Brewing Company um, and, grows, and grows it. And as everyone saw in David's slide presentation and different photographs, breweries, the late 19th century breweries at this time were massive, massive places because they produced everything. They yeah. had uh, artisans on site making their kegs, their coopers. Um, they had barns the, to house their horses. They had to obviously grow different uh, uh, ingredients um, for on-site use. Um, they had refrigeration needs or ice uh, uh, sort of warehouses. Um, they had to, you know, do things with malt. Like it, it's a massive, so usually breweries um, during this time, it wasn't just a building. It was multiple buildings. It was truly a compound. So. Mm -hmm. If you think about what Sipe would have been like uh, down on the south side, um, really sort of a major, major uh, enterprise and a major presence. So he starts um, really growing that business and does incredibly well. And it's really just in Chicago that he's selling this beer. And I always talk about how, you know, Chicago breweries were able to sell their beer only in Chicago because we drank that much. Right. right. But yes. How does how does Lake Geneva and Black Point Estate come into the picture? What is what is that uh, location and, and what is that for Sipe and his family? So um, Conrad and, and his family start to come to Lake Geneva. At the earliest records we have is they're staying at a resort adjacent to the Black Point property. At the time, it was called Case Park. And they start vacationing at Case Park in the 1870s, late 1870s, uh, on and off. And when we say it's a, it's a camp kind of park, people of means are really renting like a 10-room cottage. So these are, these are really camps for the movers and shakers of Chicago. And there's this relationship between Chicago and Lake Geneva. Going back to the Chicago fire, it's the same year the rail line connects the two cities. And you can get from downtown Chicago in 1871 to downtown Lake Geneva in 90 minutes. Just over an hour on Fridays if you took the million special and you had to be a, you know, a Selfridge or a Maytag or a Sears for that, but it was pretty convenient to get out of the pollution and dirt and noise that is the, the city. Um, keep in mind, you know, if you saw that photo I showed of horses and carriages, that's not just how beer gets moved, right? Like that's all product. Chicago streets are, are dirt roads at the time. Uh, if you have a wet spring, those dirt roads turn into muck that sometimes would swallow a man up to his calf. 
uh, on the south side, you know, the areas near the stockyards, you would have had the um, Chicago River in that area is called Bubble Creek because it's off-gassing from all the waste and byproduct that's thrown into it from the slaughterhouses. So these people were really looking to get their families out of the, out of the cities for the summer. Typically, everybody would come up to Lake Geneva on Memorial Day weekend, and then women and children would stay here at least through Labor Day. And then gentlemen would return to work on Fridays. Well, Monday morning, they would take the train and come back to Lake Geneva on Friday night. So there's always been a real strong connection um, historically from the 1870s through about the 1920s. And then uh, there's some families that like Lawrence family stayed, uh, the Peterkin family, which owned the uh, yellow taxi cab company, the Morton family. So there are some families that have just, you know, it's just been a part of their existence going back to the 1870s, right through modern era. So Lake Geneva is certainly a location where um, I guess you could call them beer barons ended up uh, having summer homes and much of the time their families stayed there throughout the summer, whereas uh, many of the, uh, the brewery owners like Saipa go back and forth and tend to business. Um, but certainly uh, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, uh, an important player, which is curious because Lauren, uh, or turn it to you, uh, you are Conrad Sipes' great, great, great granddaughter. Uh, you there, Lauren? I most certainly am. Hey. Um, okay. And you're not even from the Midwest, really. Although I know you say you feel like you're a Midwesterner. Where were you born? What's your story? And my question for you really is, when did you discover Conrad? What great questions. And Dave, thanks so much for giving a great background to, to the present. Um, yes, my name is Lauren Mack, and I am, uh, the, as Liz said so beautifully, the uh, great cubed granddaughter <laughs> of Sipe, Conrad Sipe. And I was born in Virginia. I um, am an East Coaster in that regard. Um, because my mom is a horse person and she grew up in Chicago. She grew up coming to Lake Geneva every weekend, just like everyone in the family had uh, done before, spent all her summers here. Um, but she loves horses and so she moved to horse country in Virginia. I met my father and I was born. And I went uh, through most of my life until about seven years ago and my husband said, it's time to move back to Chicago, Lauren. And I said, okay, let's go. I, I feel like that makes sense. So we got here about seven years ago and have just really um, very much felt like we're at home. And uh, it, it's been such a, a pleasure and a joy to rediscover what it means to live in the great city of Chicago and then also to be able to come to Lake Geneva um, every weekend, just like my ancestors had for so many years. Um, particularly in the summer, it's especially nice. Yeah, um, so you still, you still are a part, you, your family today, you and your husband, still happen to be able to go back to the original property. Absolutely, and as a result, it's very nice to be able to um, see Dave, um, who is taking good care of the property, which we're very appreciative of. I, I wanted to answer the question that you are alluding to, Liz, and which people often ask me, most prominently my own mother, who is the great-great-granddaughter of Sipe, who thinks that this is a crazy idea, and why on earth would you do this? I think that was the first thing she asked me when I um, told her I was uh, reviving Sipe. I hope I've convinced her now, but I'll try again right now. Um, I, am a, I love history. I always have. Some people may say that I'm stuck in, in the past, <laughs> which is... Potentially true. That's how we're kindred spirits, Liz. Um, one of the many ways. Uh, but I also really love cities, and I really um, think that their um, place in civilization is so important, especially Chicago's in the history of America. And so much of what makes Chicago great, which I've learned um, thanks to knowing Liz, is the role that, that beer has played in its founding, its development. Um, and I, I really think that history is what 
makes cities and the connection to history so strong. And I believe that it's what gives communities um, cohesion and strength and pride. And so I really wanted to be able to add to that strength of Chicago by adding to its history. And I, we can all agree that there are so many fantastic breweries uh, and brewers in Chicago already. So it's, it's not as though there needs to be another, um, another beer brand. But what I did think that Chicago was lacking was that connection to its brewing history, which Sipes Beer very much fills. And I think um, therefore provides a nice um, reminder or foundation for all of the fantastic modern breweries. If I may say, uh, Metropolitan being certainly my favorite and, and among, if not the very best. With that, as an aside, I am drinking uh, Crankshaft right now. Um, so cheers, Tracy and Doug. Um, yeah, it's interesting. People will often uh, you know, say, um, how come there's no like historic Chicago beer brand around? Because we really don't have any, right? People immediately think about old style. And of course, that's brewed in Wisconsin as well. So um, the fact that there is no historic Chicago beer around today is curious wow. and that, that sipe is sort of going to fill that void is cur is interesting to me but wait a minute back to back to uh conrad the myth the man the legend um when did you discover his story so this is my opportunity to share my powerpoint which hopefully not powerpoint but i'm hoping everyone can see this can you all see conrad uh no well and you tell that I suck at technology. There's a little green think. arrow on the bottom that says share screen. Okay, I'll work on this. I will keep talking as I fumble through this. Um, so basically, I, I grew up, you know how they, what is that saying about a fish doesn't know that it swims in water? I grew up coming to Lake Geneva every summer, just like everyone in my family always has. I'm calling in my technical support here. Um, and, and I was just, you're just surrounded by Sipe and by Sipe's uh, descendants when, when you're here. Um, as an example, you, um, here we go. Can everyone see that? Thanks, Will. <laughs> um, so as an example, first of all, here's Conrad Sipe. This is a picture that my cousin Bill took in his living room, which was great because I think it looks, he looks good in color and he's often shown in black and white. Um, he looks like a real German. Um, so this is the cornerstone or the lintel of the Seip and Lehman um, Brewery. Um, pardon my German pronunciation, I clearly am not uh, sticking to my roots here, but that's the Lager Beer Keller. Um, and as you can see down there, it was, this is from 1864. So I would grow up coming and walking past this lintel as I would walk down to the lake. I would walk over the bricks that as an aside to, to um, just comment on Dave's, uh, when they, history, <laughs> I'm tongue tied, too much uh, crankshaft. Um, when the, the brewery was torn down to make way for Michael Reese Hospital, we, and I guess it's a family thing where we can't let go of the past, brought all the bricks from this uh, site brewery up and used them as part of the driveway. So I spent my whole life basically walking over the brewery walls to get to where I wanted to go around the estate and without even really knowing what that meant. And um, I wanted to just given a, a quick example of, I think every good Zoom call needs to have some dogs in it. So I made sure to put my dogs in here. This is a few years ago when we were um, taking some pictures, but um, I'm gonna stop this share for a minute, even though that may be a bad idea, and just let you all know that when I say Sipes all around me, I'm at my grandparents' house right now, which is on Black Point below the big house where Dave is the director of. And um, the walls behind me are from Conrad Sipe maybe picked them out himself because they're from his house at 3300 um, South Michigan, um, where, where he lived with his wife. Um, and we don't ever throw anything away in our family, so brought these walls up here and put them into my grandparents' house. So I just feel like without even being aware of it, Sipe has always been around me and has always been around all of my family. Certainly his um, 
uh, family nature has run through the generations because we all are very much together and as much as possible um, come back to Lake Geneva to celebrate um, being together in nature. So um, I continue <laughs> with saying what I wanted to, what I realized that I could contribute to Chicago's history was beer, was my connection to the past and that it was time for Sipe to become un, undead, so to speak, to revive Sipe's beer and everything that he did for Chicago. And so because of who I call my beer fairy godmother, Liz Garibay, she connected me with um, Metropolitan Brewing with um, Tracy and Doug, who are, as everyone knows, fantastic lager beer brewers. And that is what Conrad Seip brewed. He was a German and he brewed lager beer. And so, so to speak, the rest is history. Um, and I wanted to share with you guys a little bit about what that means for today um, by going back to share my screen. And um, are you, can you guys see this okay? Uh, it's coming up. Yep. I see, I see the dogs next to the okay. windfall. As long as you see the dogs, that's good. All right, so another, um, another thing that I think is very cool is that Sipe was a really fantastic marketer. And I think Dave alluded to this as far as just his ingenuity, where he was making a lot of merch and selling it. And a lot of you can find his stuff on eBay today. If you're, we're all, I think we're really um, inflating because my family is always bidding against each other on eBay trying to get stuff. Um, but this is a picture of an actual beer can that was found just a few months ago in the western suburbs of Chicago by someone who was redoing their kitchen and found this in their kitchen walls. And so I think that's why it's so beautifully preserved of Sipes, Sipes Extra Pale Beer, which is what we were referring to and will be the first um, beer that we release. Um, so this is just an example of what he was doing with labels and with marketing. Um, this is another label that a good friend and, um, of the family had, Maggie Gage, um, where you can see his logo, um, original logo here. You can see his use of um, uh, graphics, which I think is, is, is beautiful. And as I bring everything back, I'm really using what he did and just making it for a modern audience. So as an example, this is the new uh, logo, which is very similar to the old one, just a little bit more, um, just a little clearer. And the S doesn't look so much like a woolly worm. <laughs> it looks a little bit more like uh, what, what beer is made out of. Um, also, an example of some of the merch that Sipe had here is a, a mug that he had. His, one of his catchphrases or slogans was just a little better than the kind you thought was best. Um, you can try and find these on, on eBay, and, and Dave's got a couple of these in the museum. Which, by the way, that, that uh, slogan is a little bit of a diss on the best brewing company, um, which was a contemporary and, and very much a competitor to Sipe. Exactly. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick on that. So, you know, the Pabst logo that has the B in the center of it, so Pabst is a lake boat captain. He's not a brewer. He marries the brewer's daughter. And it's the best family that he marries into. So when his father-in-law dies, he takes over the brewery and changes it from best to Pabst. And the slogan for Pabst was, he who drinks Pabst drinks best. Okay, so Sykes' retaliation was, we're just a little bit better than the kind you thought was best. That's pretty good. We say that's a gentlemanly volley back across the net. Um, but they're definitely <laughs> friends. Um, Pabst is an honorary pallbearer at Sipe's funeral. So I'll, I'll turn my mic off again. But business is business. <laughs> so thank you guys. That was so great to hear. Um, so just as an example, again, of modernizing what was old, our, our slogan around here is what was old is new again. This is the Stipe um, uh, symbol, and we just changed it a little bit from, as you can see, the old Stipe symbol, which to the modern, to the modern eye may read as Lipes, which we were trying to avoid. <laughs> and so how, here we're hoping that people can um, 
can read that really clearly. My husband's on a mission to make sure everyone pronounces SIPE correctly instead of SIPs or something else. So this, <laughs> what we're using, believe the hype, SIPE is your type. How about that? That'll keep it in people's mind. Wait, did um, we look, look, so, we come up with that? Oh, yeah, uh, I'm going to say yes. Nice, nice job, Will. <laughs> Um, so this is just an example of um, some of the of, of us taking those, the old slogans and the old um, visuals and putting them on new things. Um, we're using a, a modern um, slogan as well. It's the beer that built Chicago, which as we heard from, from Dave is what is true. It's what people were drinking when they were rebuilding during the Chicago, well, after the Chicago fire. Um, so that brings me to where we are now, and I'm looking forward to having um, Tracy um, take over because we are about to launch Sipes Extra Pale. And I saw in the comments a question about whether it was an ale or a, 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 a lager. And the answer is it was a pre-prohibition pilsner, which is really confusing because everyone always thinks of Extra Pale being ales, but that just makes us a little bit special, more special. Um, as you can see, um, we are very much basing our new label on the old Extra Pale label that was um, released at the Columbian Exposition in 1893. And um, because we get to work with Metropolitan, they are making a fantastic beer that I'll let Tracy explain um, more about, but we're, re we're really with the help of just some historical research and with Doug Hurst. Um, with his brewing expertise, we're able to piece together um, what uh, we believe the beer was. And the main ingredient in beer is water, and it's coming from Lake Michigan, so we know that we've got that as a strong, consistent, um, uh, strong consistency with this beer. I'm imagining that the lake is a little cleaner than it was back, back in the day. So I'm gonna stop um, sharing here and I'm gonna leave everyone with just a little fun thing. Um, this is a bottle of um, Sipes Hollander, which was one of his brands. Um, more on his brands in the future as we release them one by one. But the Holland, for the labels that I've showed you before were from empty beer bottles, but this bottle is full of liquid. And it was found somewhere around here in Lake Geneva in a barn or something. And, and I found it oddly just in our liquor cabinet. That's how things go around here. You just find things from a long time ago and wonder what they are. But this has got about three inches of liquid in it. And our big question is, is can we do some DNA testing or whatever kind of chemistry testing that would be and find out exactly what is in here? There's some who speculate that this could be full of construction worker pee instead of beer, but I don't want to say that. I know that's a little bit gro gross, um, but I think it'll be a pretty cool thing to open this up and see um, see if we can figure out what this, what, what may be in here, what the ingredients were originally. So sure. a big thank you for your interest. Yeah, I yeah. mean, when, when you came to me, Lauren, I was, like I said, really excited. And as you and I were talking through um, the story and the beer, um, and who to make it uh, for a modern audience, immediately my mind went to Metropolitan. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. Tracy, you there? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Tracy Hurst, co-founder, co-owner, uh, chief of everything at Metropolitan, uh, Brazilian board president. Um, Metropolitan makes some of the best lager in the country and you know, when you're looking at these different labels and a little bit of, of the chat room was discussing this, these beer labels and these beer styles from the 19th century are labeled very differently than what we know of styles today. So extra pale ale is not the kind of pale ale that um, we're, we're drinking right now. And so knowing that Sipe uh, was a lager making uh, brewery, I knew that Metropolitan would be a great um, uh, brewery to do it. And I love connections. I love all kinds of connections. And the fact is, is that Tracy is from Wisconsin. Tracy and Doug are both from Wisconsin. Um, so that was uh, another natural connection um, that would sort of uh, round out the whole story. So Tracy, 
Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you and Doug and some of your brewing team have been doing to reinterpret um, site for a modern audience and what, what's it going to be like and, and anything you want to share or can share? Absolutely. Uh, again, Tracy Hurst, uh, co-founder and president of Metropolitan Brewing. Um, we've been in business for 11 years now, so it's been a very long time since I personally have brewed any beer. Uh, but my business partner still heads up our brew department and our brew team. And, uh, you know, Liz and I met many years ago and collaboration is always going to be a topic between us because we both really believe that collaboration makes more happen. Um, so uh, learning Lauren's story, reading up on the history a little bit. Um, in terms of the beer, we're actually borrowing very much from the traditional recipe. Um, back in the mid 1800s, um, German brewers immigrated here, uh, like Dave was telling us about, and um, lager yeast was brought to the Philadelphia area in um, the mid 1800s. Um, but the brewers generally had to use what was more readily available here in the new world. So um, we are using uh, six row, which home brewers will know is you have six row and two row of barley. Um, six row has a little bit more protein. Um, so we decided to use that as the base malt. And then we use a little bit of melanoid malt, which gives it that sort of caramelized flavor because back in the day, you wouldn't use steam like we do to brew beer anymore. You would use, you would have used direct fire, which would caramelize the wort. So using melanoid malt, which is basically a pre-caramelized type of malt, uh, gives you that flavor. And then, of course, I mean, I don't know if it was a government subsidy back then, but um, flaked corn was readily available. So we're using flaked corn in the recipe. Now, uh, macro brewers um, use additives, but are, you know, um, processed additives. Um, corn syrup and things like that. We are using 15% flaked corn and, um, you know, wanting to stay away from any kind of cloying flavor. Um, this type of additive doesn't actually do that. It adds body and texture, but it still contributes to a lightness and crispness, crispness of the beer, of the finished beer. In terms of hops, Cluster hops was the main hop grown in, uh, on, you know, in North America for a long time. And uh, cluster hops, we found and we are using cluster hops for this brew um, for traditional reasons, but also because we really like the sort of mellow bitterness that you get from it. And then for the aroma hop, we're using Saz um, because you know, as far as our beers are concerned, this Pilsner is a little bit hoppier than we would make. Um, and we really wanted to have that aroma there to support that because if you drink our beers, you know, even if you get a distinct flavor, it's going to be balanced out because that's generally what the Germans like to drink is well-balanced beer. So, um, the Saz adds that, you know, if there's anything flashy about the beer, it's going to be that, you know, super bright aroma from Saz hops. If you think of a traditional Czech pills that's very similar to what, you know, that's what the aroma will be like in this beer. Um, we've of course run test batches. Generally the brew team doesn't actually have to run test batches because we've just been doing it this long and we know how to do our research. But we did do, I can't remember Lauren, maybe three or four test batches of this beer um, just to be sure that the balance was right and um, that, even though it's well within our wheelhouse to make a beer like this, to make sure that it represented the authenticity of what Lauren was going for and what um, she was trying to honor in beers made by earlier, you know, early German immigrants to this area. Um, and the brew, the brew is underway, like it's on the production schedule. So we're, we're really excited to have it for ourselves primarily, because that's why we do what we do. <laughs> it's because we want beer. I, I am so excited for this because we've been working on this for a while now. Um, yeah. And, you know, when, when Metropolitan said yes to this, which is my next question, um, 
I knew that it was going to take a minute because you guys are perfectionists and the test batches were going to be needed and making sure Lauren liked it and making sure everybody was happy. Uh, so it's definitely been a journey. Um, by the way, everybody, uh, please ask questions. If you're on Zoom, uh, ask it in the chat. If you're on Facebook, please type it in below and we will get to your question um, before we wrap this all up. Uh, so Tracy, when I came to you and said, look, there's a really cool project. I think Metropolitan is the perfect partner for it. Um, kind of like with our Bruseum discussions, you pause, but you really don't hesitate because it kind of makes sense for you guys. Why did you want to do this? Well, you know, we're, our company is founded on exactly the same ideas that Lauren was telling us. And that is, you know, beers have been made for, you know, two centuries and we should pay attention to how it was originally done. And we should pay attention to the agriculture and try to put ourselves in that historical context of what they were doing. Um, to us, it's interesting to think of, you know, moving somewhere and setting up shop and trying to integrate yourself into what's happening. So, you know, when you think about immigration to this area, it's not exactly a flawless history to be sure, but um, the German influence in this area is undeniable. And um, we feel like it's important to remember our history. It's important to remember where we come from, good and bad. And beer is one of the ways, and this is something I know the three of us agree on a lot, um, beer is, probably one of the perfect ways to tell a historical story, to tell the story of humanity in a certain area. So the beer sounded great. The project sounded like a lot of fun. And, you know, meeting Lauren, obviously you've all met her. It was like easy to decide to go into business. Um, so, you know, it, it, it would just definitely aligned with what we like to do and what we think is important in the work that we do. Sure. Um, I think a really good question here, um, and maybe David and Lauren, you guys would be good uh, folks to talk about this because it's certainly something we've discussed over and over and over again. And Peter's asking if the recipe was based on an original source document. No. <clears throat> um, to our knowledge, we've never really come across much in the way of business records or our brew mentioned there's a ton of ephemera and advertising because the site was really uh, keen at that and, and sort of on the forefront. But I think because the brewery sold to that conglomerate company and then it changes, um, it goes through a couple iterations, uh, there's just not much left. Um, and we've checked with so many historical societies, the Newberry Library, Chicago, Historical Society, the Smithsonian. Um, they might be in a box somewhere, you know, but we haven't come across them yet. I mean, that's and a good question. Gonna... We deduced the recipe, sorry, Lord. We deduced the recipe based on the era and based on what was available at that time. And, um, you know, when I was talking to the guys about using Saz for aroma hops, you know, both brewers looked at me and said, well, they probably had at least that imported. So, you know, that's kind of how we built the recipe is inference and some deduction. And we also have, we do have historical records which describe the beers and on the more modern label of the extra pale, it talks about made with Bohemian hops, which is what SAS are. Um, so we have some pretty good guesses based on what Sipe and his colleagues wrote about the beers as to how things tasted. Um, at least from description. And the, and the other thing that we have um, is back to uh, David uh, talking about Site being present at the 1893 World's Fair um, and Site being a great marketer. A lot of these uh, breweries, bigger breweries, spent a lot of money creating fancy pamphlets for their, for their exhibition spaces. And they would tell you about their beer. They would tell you about ingredients that they used. And so in the 1893 World's Fair Sipe book, he talks about hops, he talks about different things. He also refers to his beer as a health tonic, um, something that will make you stronger and it'll fortify everything and anything and um, really sort of flowery conversation about why Sipe is so good for you and you should drink it. So 
There are various places where we are able to grab uh, specific ingredients or um, various things that would help. Oh, there it is, David, thank you. Um, different things that would help us inform um, what we could potentially do with this beer. Yeah, the, the language is great. Um, you know, I, I wish marketing was as flowery now as it was 130 years ago. Sometimes it is. <laughs> okay, so um, let's see here. Uh, what will the aesthetic? Uh, what what will the aesthetic of site? Hang on a second. Ah, uh, well, um, Lauren, do you want to talk a little bit more about the site brand, the modern site brand? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I'm really happy to have had the opportunity or feel fortunate to have had the opportunity to work with the Stout Collective who was able to help me take um, all of the old image images that we had access to and turn them into the more modern brand. Um, if I, uh, I will show again the picture of the, um, the beer just to give an example of what we're, um, talking about as far as how the, what the label is going to look like, but um, we really wanted to draw on the old symbolism. I'm hoping everyone can see this. The old symbols where we were using um, the same colors, where we were using um, the same imagery of barley in the background, the same logos, but with, with, with just a crisper modern look and also explaining a little bit what's going on because no one would necessarily understand what an extra pale is in 2020, whereas they may very well have understood what it was um, in 1880. We um, have designed um, great looking uh, beer carriers and um, mother cartons, and I'm just excited for everyone to see them. And I'm really delighted today for the first time, um, you guys are, are hearing it straight, straight from our lips tonight. Um, Tracy and I would like to announce that this beer will be available to purchase um, and to be able to drink it for the 4th of July. And so we're gonna be having it um, available at bars around, um, Lake Geneva, and then um, as things start to open up in Chicago, and certainly um, will be available out of the Metropolitan um, Tap Room and, and Bottle Shop. So get ready to drink some beer this summer, and um, we're going to keep you all posted via social media um, about when the releases are and exactly where and when you can, can buy it. Which is, again, incredibly exciting that we have a date uh, we know it's coming. Uh, we know that we're going to be able to drink it soon. And the fact that it's 4th of July is pretty outstanding, right? Because this is really, Sipe, the Sipe story is the perfect almost immigrant story where he comes uh, from Germany and he starts, David, right? He starts as a, as a wagon driver. He's not even, getting to that brewery ownership is a ways down the road. He works hard to get there. Um, so this is a little bit of a, the American dream and 4th of July making it happen. Absolutely. Right. He, he um, you know, by all accounts came here with not, you know, a huge nest egg, uh, farmer, hotelier, you know, just kept working at it and eventually uh, became, you know, very, very successful. And let me tell you that, um, after everything that's been happening, it certainly is great to have something to look forward to, right? Uh, and actually be able to drink Sipe um, at Metro Brewing, which is one of the OG breweries of the modern craft uh, era in Chicago, and drinking it right on the river um, is going to be pretty special. Um, if anyone has any other questions, please ask now. Uh, David, Lauren, Tracy, do you want to say anything else before we wrap this up? I would like to just say thank you. Um, Liz, I'm always so thankful to you for your friendship and everything that you've done to help with this project. Dave, of course, I'm thankful to you for your friendship and for everything you've done to protect and promote the Black Point Estate and Gardens. Please all come for a visit. Um, 
And Tracy, you, um, I thank you for your friendship and for making this beer um, and for being a great partner going forward, you and Doug. It's really been a pleasure to know you. I'm looking forward to drinking some Sipe with you. And of course, to everyone on this call um, and all of the supporters of Sipe, um, the whole purpose of beer is to share community and stories and create memories together. So we're looking forward to doing that with all of you. Yeah, yeah. and uh, rest assured that the Bruseum will host something, uh, you know, maybe virtually, maybe at Metropolitan. Uh, Dave and I have been talking about doing something at Lake Geneva for a couple of years now. Um, that porch is a great place to, uh, to have a, a beer, have a sip of Sipe. Um, so there's definitely things coming uh, with the Bruseum and with Sipe and Metro and, and Black Point Estate for sure. Um, one quick question. If anyone came to the Beer Culture Summit um, that we hosted in the fall, it was your first taste of this collaboration between uh, Metro and Sipe. And um, we actually had some test batches available for people to taste. And Sally, who is here on this uh, call right now, was there and was able to taste it. And she's asking if the recipe is anything like the one at the Beer Culture Summit. Oh, the uh, you're asking. Um... That's, you know, that's kind of a technical question for the brew team. I know that the recipe was developed the way I described it, but in terms of um, tweaking, you know, I think when we started presenting it, Sal's, it was pretty close. Um, you know that there's always going to be adjustments with scale up, um, but, you know, uh, I mean, that's a good question. And there probably was slight differences, but we've been working with the same backbone of the recipe and the fermentation schedule all along. So someone with your palate, you could probably tell the difference if there was a change, <laughs> but um, probably not a significant one. Yeah, I do, I do remember uh, Doug talking about tweaking it since then, but nothing, nothing dramatic. Yeah. Uh, the decision to make a pre-prohibition pilsner, you know, that that is that definitely was the foundation of the beer, and we were going to go in that direction. So um, it's not, you know, we I, we always talk about creativity through discipline. You know, learn how something was done before you go screwing around with it. <laughs> so this beer kind of stands on its own in terms of, you know, a style, and we were happy to explore that so um you know for lauren's purposes it's going to be as authentic as we can get it yeah and lauren actually um we know where it'll be available here in chicago with metro uh will it be available across the border do we know that yet border in wisconsin yeah yeah, absolutely. We have several um, bars and restaurants already lined up. For those of you who are familiar with the infamous Owl, <laughs> um, for those of you who are familiar with Lake Geneva Country Meats, and there, there are many more. So um, come on up and wear your mask and grab a six pack and we'll drink some beer. Awesome. All right, everybody. So uh, 4th of July, look out for Sipes uh, Pilsner. Um, which is inspired by the Extra Pale Ale, brewed by Metropolitan Brewing here in Chicago. Um, I am seeing some chatter about cycling up to Black Point Estate. I'm in. I'm in for a long ride uh, with the greatest reward at the end. Um, and I forgot to mention the most important thing. It will be for sale at the uh, Black Point Estate and Garden, so you can oh, really have a good sure. Yeah. And I have, a spare, I have a spare bedroom at the farm, so if you cycle up and can't cycle back, um, we, could probably, we could probably work something out. I don't understand the people who do the round trip. You got to reward yourself for, you know, take the Metro back for Pete's sake. Um, all right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you, Liz. Yeah, yeah. David, uh, Lauren, Tracy, you guys are awesome. Um, so excited to, to work with you on all of this and, and Finally excited to, to potentially have a beer with you all to celebrate this. Um, look out for it. Lauren, um, are you on social media, uh, website, anything like that you want to plug for Sipe? Yes, absolutely. Instagram um, at Sipe Beer, same for Twitter. Um, and then Facebook, the Conrad Sipe Brewing Company. Yeah. And then website, sipebrewing.com. You can buy a t-shirt. 
Um, uh, Tracy, is there anything uh, you want to plug while you're here? Uh, I wasn't thinking about it. Sipe, yeah, definitely the Sipe here. But um, I'm sure lots of you have seen that. Um, it took some tricky, yeah, there it is, sales. <laughs> took some uh, tricky um, business maneuvers in the current climate we're in, but we uh, managed to get some of our beers out in cans this year because, you know, we're good for a tagline too. And like we've been saying, we're a lager brewery. We take our time to do everything. <laughs> well, I'm, like I said, I'm so excited about these cans because they make it easy to throw into a backpack uh, and a kayak, um, which I'm really pumped about. But again, thank you. Throw it into your backpack to ride up to I know. Geneva and see Lauren. Good idea. Um, thank you guys again. Really appreciate taking the time to talk about the project. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us for another uh, Bruzeum event. Um, we're going to keep doing it as we slowly get back to normal. We will be here for you uh, sharing some beer history and culture throughout the world, throughout time. Um, ChicagoBruzeum.org uh, for more events. We actually are going to be announcing a slew of new events um, next week. So make sure to visit our website or keep up with us on social media at Shy Bruseum on Instagram and Twitter and on Facebook. Uh, we have a newsletter that goes out. Um, easy peasy to get all the information on what we're doing. Um, so thanks again for your support and we will catch you next time. Thanks everybody.